Uh, the next speaker, Hanya Gomez, uh, will join us only by video screen. So you will see her in a second and I will uh, start to present her to you. So Hanya Gomez uh, is working in the Fundación de la Memoria, Memoria Urbana Caracas and she is founder and chair of Doco Momo Venezuela Architects. Um, she, uh, oh yeah, she, she studied at the Facultad de Arquitectura y Urbanismo Universidad Central de Venezuela Caracas and received there her Master of Science in Urban Design at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at the Columbia University, New York. She is president of the foundation Fundación de la Memoria Urbana and director of the Centro de la Ciudad since 201. She was a curator of Giopontis Villa Lanchard in 2001 and a curator of the exhibition Gego Architect in 2007. She's author, curator and architect uh, and architecture and city critic of the Venezuelan newspaper El Nacional. And we see her here. Hello and welcome, Hania Gomez. And we are very pleased to hear now your talk on Gego in Caracas. Please. Thanks to the Museum in Stuttgart and Stephanie Ranger, of course, and Fundación Diego. I'm very pleased to have the chance to talk from Caracas. I'm sad I am not there with you, but at least we can uh, share in this beautiful conference and exhibition that is currently going on at the museum. Uh, my lecture would be uh, on text that is in the exhibition catalog and which is um, a reflection of what I did um, in the exhibition book Architect back in 2007. So it's a, a, it's a like a, a revisiting my, my, my own work. It's called Gego in Caracas. I quote an initial phrase by Gego. My work and my concern for the visual arts have been gradually developing in me, owing to a combination of factors and more particularly to my education as an architect. I end of quote. Part one, a modern city within a modern city. Gego began to make her mark on the modern art and architecture of Venezuela in the 1950s. Yet she differed from the other artists who were working at the time in that she was a trained architect. When she arrived in Caracas in 1939, she aimed to work as such. But from 1947, Gego turned to seek new ways of building spaces, which nonetheless never ceased to be architectural. Being a pioneer in many ways, from her first designing jobs to her days as an influential professor, both in the Facultad de Arquitectura y Urbanismo at Universidad Central de Venezuela and at the Instituto de Diseño of the Fundación Neumann, to the years of her growing success as an artist, Gago traced a very personal path within the Venezuelan art and architectural scene, creating an oeuvre that, although aware of other contemporary artists and architects, always stood completely apart. At the end of the 1930s, oil exploitation in Venezuela had begun to Construction was progressively made throughout the country, and Caracas was to be the best mirror of this new reality. The city that gave everyone count was on the threshold of the Everything had to be cleared away for the sake of modernizing the capital city. The young architect arrived just in time to witness the gradual disappearance 
of Caracas Bull colonial structures and the mutation of the haciendas on the eastern lands of the valley into a brand new metropolis. But more importantly, she was witness to the great impact of the creation of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas, 1944-1970, was to have inexorably guiding the country's path into modernity and shaping its identity. To study almost any aspect of Caracas modernity, including Guerrero's career, we must come back to this monument by Venezuelan architect Carlos Raúl Villanueva, which has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since the year 2000. During most of the architectural and artistic searches in Venezuela have developed from within and around this modern masterwork and its great project of the integration of the arts. When Villanueva, who had a both art education, worked the integrations of the arts project, he took a visionary step to open architecture up to experimentation in the field of modern art. As he wrote in his Escritos, I quote, I am concerned about the problem of a new synthesis of the different means of expression. It is my aspiration to redirect architecture, painting, and sculpture to an intimate, inextricable, significant cohesion. End of quote. These works echo the Bound of Radiant Initial Manifesto, proclaimed in Weimar in 19. 19, calling for the creation of the new building of the city, which will embrace architecture and sculpture and painting in one unity, and which will rise one day toward heaven from the hands of a million workers like the crystal symbol of a new faith. Villanueva gradually assembled a remarkable team of national and international artists who worked to collaborate with him in the composition of the different architectural spaces of the Ciudad Universitaria complex. Their works, coming from multiple traditions and artistic universes, nourished Villanueva's spatial experimentation, their idiosyncratic presence leaving a singular mark on the university's modern skyline. At the midpoint of the century, modern architecture was called upon risky and vigorous problems than other forms of art. Villanueva aimed to experiment anew with various forms of integration. His sculptures and murals, free of all traditional relationship with the space in which they were located, works with a decorative function a l'ancien, and proper integrations within the architectural context. The resulting Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas was so successful, successful in doing so that the surrounding city, after a period of coexistence with this experience, passed progressively from observing it merely as a singular chapter in art history to absorbing it as a daily component of its urban and architectural identity. A modern city within a modern city. The university city began to have a powerful impact on Caracas artistic milieu, an impact that has not to its magical effect even to today. The paradigmatic art architecture collaboration soon moved beyond the gates of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas to be installed in the real city as early as the 1960s. In 1958, the year that marked the dawn of the newly gained era of democracy in the country, the quality of the brilliant modernist campus, which had been created under a dictatorship, began to produce multiple reverberations, other epics, other architectures, and other art. Besides the list of authors included in the original artistic program of the campus, the rest of the local architectural and artistic community began to recreate multiple versions of the integrations, integration of the arts concept in every new project they were commissioned for. Like parallel wefts, they went from architecture to art and vice versa, interweaving in their projects the close experience of the artistic spaces of the university city with those of the real city. 
A growing demand for works of art in public spaces and buildings arose in all of Caracas. For two decades, the city experienced the episode of urban art. It was an authentic movement that encompassed the already prevalent building boom. The capital's artistic and architectural realms were sensibly transformed. Every new architectural or infrastructural project laid claim to an art of its own. New spatial, spatial experimentation was conceived and innumerable artistic landscapes started to emerge as the city was also expanding very, very fast. These were the more works fuori le mura, outside of the university campus, that invent the real city from within, establishing an architecture and artistic movement that was there to stay. The new art began to play a role on the streets of the capital in accordance with its new architecture, and it included, as in Villanueva's campus, plenty of murals. Part two, city without ghetto. Villanueva knew Gabe's work. She had been working as an architect in Caracas and already began experimenting artistically during her stay in Tarma, near the capital, before making her debut appearance at the Universidad Central de Venezuela in 1959, when she started teaching in the Faculty of Architectural Planning almost immediately after the campus opened. Her academic participation in the faculty was intense and very influential. It couldn't and didn't go unnoticed. Gail was always informed, always on. Her task was to ensure that the educational programs she conducted were kept up to date with the latest teaching in the international context. In the basic composition workshop, or Taller Gero, the students were trained as they were in the Bauhaus, with contrastivist methods of teaching. But besides analyzing this of the Cathedral of Milan or the works of Frank Ray Wright, Gebo had been studied the contemporary work in Caracas by her architect peers, such as the anglo building by the firm of Vegas and Gallia from 1956, or the Shell building by the firm Bachelet and Bradbury from 1950. This was proof of her awareness and interest in the state of the art and the current effect of effervescent architectural production happening all around town. In the academic exercises, Gil was able, together with her students, to explore the phenomenological, sensorial, functional, and urban dimensions of her compositions. The results of the exercises were plastic objects that brought, I quote, mental abstractions to real spaces as three-dimensional creations, end of quote. Once they were done, even in the case of the most abstract words coming from the architecture school and later from the chairs of modeling and two and three-dimensional shapes as they, at the Instituto de Diseño from 1966 to 1971, the student works where it assigned an hypothetical function, a human scale, or an urban dimension, even if they were stripped of all their data and built in spaces, they looked too much like buildings. Gary herself often pictured the words of her students altogether, erecting fantastic cities. A photograph, a photograph by her, this one we are seeing here, of one of the student projects recalls also of Giorno Ponti's famous 1954 proposal for the Avenida Bolivar called Idea for Caracas, in which he aimed to create a linear display along the avenue of a collection of the best modern architecture there was in the world, a kind of a very early collage theme. In 1962, Gregor even won the first prize for at the Salon de Arte of the Facultad de Arquitectura and Urbanismo with a work on paper called Sin Titulo, without title, from 1962, A Watercolor. Gregor's important educational work left an indelible mark 
who know the architects that came out of the School of Architecture in those years. I myself count into those students that came out from her ideas in the school. In the academic exercise for the year, the memory of her formal education in pre-war Germany was always present. Thus, her stay until 1966 at the architecture faculty was of the utmost importance. However, as was the case with many other major Venezuelan artists, such as Jesús Soto, Villanueva did not include Gay in the great project of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas. Visiting the university campus today, one can nevertheless find one of her works, El Chorro, Cuatro Ocupaciones, from 1974, hanging above the living room of the Library of the Architecture Faculty. The piece was part of an exhibition that took place at the exhibition center and stayed in place when it closed down. It is significant, though, that the only work by Gay in the Ciudad Universitaria is installed within the Department of Architecture. Gecko's absence from the original university project was essentially a matter of timing. By 1944, 1946, when the plan for the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas was gestating, Gecko was either working for construction companies and planning offices or attempting small independent architectural projects. This period gave rise to her first unveiled project, a two story house in a new zone of the city named El Conde, commissioned by contractors Corral and Salomon. It also saw her joining of the office Luis Roche, one of the major planning enclaves for the embellishment of the new Caracas, where she possibly helped with the design of the new urban development of Los Caobos, shown in the image by architect Enrique Garcia Maldonado. She also worked on other architectural projects, especially in interior design by other architects for restaurants, bars, and a nightclub. Eventually, in 1947, she designed and built two houses. They represent the foremost extant example of Gabe's Caracas architecture. The pair of adjacent villas, which Gabe made for her own family and a couple she was friends with, located in the neighborhood of Los Shores, to the east of the valley. They were Quinta Cuculipan, already demolished, and Quinta Emilorabe from 1947. The latter, an important example of Caracas architecture being inserted in nature is a particularly beautiful palatial house with noble proportions, where space and volumes are balanced with wisdom and elegance. A house with a small patio and double pitch high roof covered with plate tiles, undoubtedly reflecting the classical and monumental spirit of the German neo-academic architecture of the period. It's us, on the one hand, the traditional shapes, the sculpture simplified of the Kuz Museum Basel designed by Paul Bonas, Gregor's professor at the Technische Volkswagen. On the other hand, it is very similar to a couple of nearby houses in the Choros attributed to Swiss Venezuelan architect Carlos Guinan Sandoz. This house, El Urape, constitutes a major work by, by Gregor, in my opinion. Still conserves in, in its interiors an interesting, impressive model designs for furniture and lamps, many of them of them built in. And it is the only testimony to her architectural and interior design still standing. On top of this, its greatest interest lies in the plan itself, a chain of articulated rectangles that announce the sculpture that Gable would make for the Banco Industrial de Venezuela years later in 1962. The floating rough iron railings, meanwhile, arranged in a beehive to part, were pioneers of her later work, work the Hugo's Simpapel. Well preserved at a lifted landmark, the villa awaits and dreams of a better future in Caracas, culture for life. In 1949, following the experience of Quinta Lugabe and at a time when the project of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas had already been under construction for five years, Gabe teamed up with her husband, Herman, German businessman Ernst Kunz, to start a workshop for design and making lamps and furniture, the Fabrica de Lámparas y Muebles de Madera Urbanistaria Kunz, which would last four years. In spite of all this design activity, by 1954, the year of the triumphal inauguration of the Aula Magna in the University City Center complex, Gego was about to begin a new life, 
continuing her personal quest but following a totally different path, the path of art. Remaining an individual present within the same architecture and urban universe, Gago watched from afar the images of Caracas' modern process, dazzled by architectural space and passionately engaged in the zeitgeist that the city was building, a zeitgeist that both the city and herself were about to live. Part 3, Gago Architect. From 1961 to 1986, thanks to the experience of the Sion Universitaria de Caracas, the demand for works of art in public buildings and spaces continued to increase. Every new architecture project, every urban renewal, every new urbanism demands the presence of one or more artists. There are public works of all kinds, especially of a virtual architectural nature. The city dematerialized to become a field for visual exploration. Because of her education, they grew apart from the other artists, but she did not miss the movement. She took advantage of it, working alone at a different level. Her integration projects were different from the work of the other artists of her time. The reason, the reason for this is very simple. She was the artist and the engineer architect of each public or private artwork that she undertook. She understood perfectly well its role in the urban space. She sent the portions of the volumetry. She managed the scale of each construction plan. She even specially completed the site where her pieces were to be installed, and she knew the technique, how to build with it, how to get the work done. This is the effect of La Dolce Doctrina. The installations reveal Gabriel as a draft woman of technical drawings and as a model builder. Even though she delegated the final phase of her works to a technician, Gail went through the entire process. She planned, weighed, defined dimensions, and specified details on the drawing table. She did not waste time. Each piece of work was projected over the, her colleagues' plans, turning the base building into a field where new rules would be established. She declared, and I quote, I work without breaking or opposing architecture. Space determines my work and also, once it is done, my work can change the effect of space. The work I, went, I want to do cannot be conceived independently from architecture. I am interested in projecting art into the surrounding space, and every time this is a different, this is a different challenge. End of quote. Her works are parallel architectures that interact with the buildings in a compositional dialogue through space, as if they were placed in the city, even if they are inserted in a new Dear context, they perform as part building. While the words of other artists lock themselves up in the game of their own plastic discourses, ranged with more or less luck against architectural reality, Gago's buildings, which consider the void or space in general as something active, use the host architecture to look as urban spaces. Gago had many commissions for artistic interventions, interventions in Caracas. Between 1961 and 1962, she built her first actual installation inside a 1950s bank designed by architect Martin Vegas, the Banco Industrial Venezuela, in a large vertical courtyard flanked by railings and stairs. She proposed a large sculpture, a second stair of aluminum, which competed with the architecture itself. For this proposal, she drew a first draft, basing her works compositional matter metrics on the distinct heights and levels open to the pattern. It is a staircase of flames that refers to the surrounding architecture which rivals the duplicates that did Martin Vegas and is made of as many aluminum tubes as the pattern itself becoming both its celebration and its allegory. Those were the years of fantastic architectures. Gago admired the expressionism of Felix Candela of Bruce Goff, of Ernst Nilsson, and Frey Oti. These architectures would soon begin to resonate in her own, own production. Thus, in front of a neutral brick building like a Borgos and Berger, she worked a great tower. Presedi Pies from 1967 with parallel lines French between two circular rings. The vertical projection plan done by Gay was a marvel of accuracy. The tower, now removed, 
done with neon threads, lit up after dawn and after dusk and became a powerful landmark urban material landscape of the Avenida Casanova in Caracas. Similarly, Gago created the aerial structure, uh, which Stephanie showed before Flechas from 1968, in a shopping center, the Centro Comercial Chacaito by the Italian architect Antonio Pizzani from 1968. The commission worked to mark the entrance of the Studio 12 art gallery located in the basement. Flechas fragilely swung in the space of a patio and next to the outdoor stairways for only a short while. It was removed from sight badly a few years later and has never lost been and has been lost ever since. Later on, in 1869, at the base of an office tower by architect Tomas Anaria, she elaborated a mural that played with the rhythm of the facade bristles. The East Headquarters Tower from 1963 is famous for its use of solar protection, which you can see in the upper part of the photograph, um, and the development of a detached skin. Gay Wolgi and Neufer would contribute at the base of this building with a different skin. They wanted a conventional mural, we suggested one with flat bars. I quote Gay. The rhythm of the different shades made with small planes descending along the western facade ends right before touching the floor of the plaza. There is where the work is placed. Silhouette against the wall and vitrified outside, it puts together a brand new composition based on so multiple. With multiples of the Fasaba de Sanabria facade, to which it neither submits nor remains indifferent. It is indeed an architecture of relief, settled within the general laws of composted architecture. Like a modern rusticato in the base of an ancient building, the mural is different from the masonry but precedes the rest of the architecture. Then in 1962, she built the work Cuerdas inside the Parque Central Complex by the Francisco and Shaw. Here, the commission itself was predicated on architecture. It was meant to mark the entrance to an art space, the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Caracas, and send them initially, initially into the exhibition, exhibition inner space. The structure spans a reflecting cone, over a reflecting cone. The resulting into plane of curved service surfaces built with parallel nylon ropes create a radically new space although it simplified Gabe's original desire of hanging a large net between the party central volumes that surround the work that of skyscrapers, I mean. Um, Gabe had to make sketches and perspectives, work hard, hard on the model, and resolve all the design details. The ropes are tied and strung in bar nettles, which are anchored by cables to the complete walls. Parallel streams of water also flow from the structure, which is tensioned above the water pump. It undoubtedly recalls something novel that refers mainly to the membrane landscapes for or duct movements in edges, which were being created at the time by many architects, including Boucher Blondin and Filippone in the Marie Thomas Pavilion at the Brussels World Fair from 1950, and of course, Fred Otto. In the preliminary sketches for the, this magnificent work, Cuerdas, now almost destroyed, it is, it is possible to reconstruct Gabe's design method. Let's expand and diversify from then on. In 1963, 73, sorry, the architect made a proposal for the northern space at Centro Comercial Pacific Mercedes, a building by Walter Gates Albert from 1967, where Gabe imagined a vast, fluctuating environmental net hanging from the triple height ceiling and from all the levels looking out into the space. This pre preliminary of the ridicularia would consist of angular modules that embrace the high cylindrical columns, becoming a banister in some cases and serving as a capital or as a ceiling in others. Right after this, in 1974, Gebo reused the idea for the this idea for the Pasaje Concordia in Savannah Grande for shipping built version of his building, Nubis, Nubis, Clouds, an environmental sculpture that is no longer in existence today. Following on from this design, Gego built the Great Quadrilateral Environment from 1982 at the Ollada Metro Station. Above an existing structural grid, Gego superimposed a square net overlapping between two stories. 
to previously tested this net by drawing a net effect on the station construction plan between structural axis 13 and 14, one of the most beautiful works on paper of the combinations of quadruple models, which were later to be built with aluminum tubes and iron wires. They would wander around her drawing table until they found a defined space, a defined place. From 1969 until 1982, Gep created the renowned Reticularia projects in Caracas, New York, and Ford. This fluctuating environmental sculpture is a splendid metaphor of the city, featuring flying crowns reminiscent of Elisinski, neoplastic process, Antonio Gaudí's inverse walls, now in gables, surfaces, and twists, canals, ports, inland seas, ships, and all of her previous projects. The lyrical cityscapes of Paul Klee will never be able to host as many cities and territories as the Reticularia, a fantastic urban utopia, splendid in the air, with which Gero passed from the systematic research of singular space produced by the exploration of geometric form to this passionate continuum of territorial design. The Wars Architecture's catalog, doing all her years of work in a virtual encyclopedic matrix, click together in a contextual discourse where space continues to be the most important thing, only that it has now become a dialectic of space, like the city. The illusory illus illus construction of this new urban fabric would go on to generate an, an, an infinite and fluid urban sprawl in which natural and urban imagined sites would succeed one another. From Caracas to Stuttgart to Hamburg, memory and dreams interweave back and forth in endless, fantastic landscapes. Thank you very much.